Welcome to the Good Corn Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois, and we have got a great show for you today. We are going to be talking about our newly planted trees and what to do to get them ready for something they have not encountered since 1803. What could that be? It's not happening this year. It's happening in 2024. It's going to be a big deal for newly planted trees. And you know I'm not doing this by myself. I am joined, as always, every single week by horticulture educator Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris. I'm very excited for this event unseen since 1803. I know. I think we've been, we've talked about this every single year we've done the podcast too. And um, so we've this has been, you know, a multi-year hype uh, thing that's about to happen here with the emergence of, of what is it, Ken? What, what are we looking forward to in 2024? We've got the periodical cicadas. We've got brood 13 and brood 19 coming out. It's the first time that's happened at the same time since 1803. So it'll be pretty much the entire state. It's going to be nuts. It's going to be uh, awesome. We're going to have to all invest in hearing protection. It is going to be loud. Um, and we are going to dive into uh, what exactly that's going to mean for our, our landscape next year. But first, Ken, um, let's talk a little bit about current events in terms of we have been going through a significant drought. We had a significant historical derecho move through. Um, in terms of per precipitation, where we're at in, in July, at least when I look at some of the precipitation records and the maps right now, July, we're about on track for the month. Now, when we look at the whole year, we are still in a deficit. So it is still dry out there. And it's about to get really hot. Actually, today is the first day in what looks to be a, a good long stretch of, of hot weather. And uh, I, I, we're going to have to cut this podcast short so I can go water my, my garden. So um, how are things going down in Jacksonville for you? Um, same way. Uh, mm -hmm. So we, we've started watering the garden again because it's gotten a little dry. Uh, the rain we have had has been, you know, kind of strong, but not, not a whole lot of accumulation. So yeah, watered and we're going to keep up the watering because yeah, it's, I think it was a, well, Thursday, by the time people are listening, this would be yesterday or two days ago. Forecast saying close to 100 down here. So it'll be, it'll be lots of watering. Uh, so hopefully we can limp our plants through and, and get them through the this, this heat. You, you know, and this also, we were talking before we started recording that school starts in about three weeks. And and I don't know about anybody else and, and or, or you can like, Whenever school starts, it seems like it's always the hottest week of the year uh, around that that time. So I think we're going to have maybe a couple weeks of it's going to be really hot out. Yeah, more than likely, that, that does seem to be the way <laughs> the way that works. So exactly, good thing. Well, there's air conditioning. Exactly. Yeah, I I remember. I I mean, I was a, a kid. Uh, there was a school I went to. We didn't have air conditioning up until we got to uh, the 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 middle school there. And then we did have air conditioning. So, but, but yeah, I can't imagine anymore. <laughs> Growing up and I've gotten used to it. I think we always had air conditioning in school, but our house didn't have air conditioning when I was a kid. So we got real hot. We'd go to the basement or go to the grocery store and hang out or hang out in the freezer section. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I guess, you know, also in, in that vein of things, um, at this point in time, like I mentioned, we had a derecho that took out a lot of trees in the Illinois landscape. It was like this, this massive wave. And we talked about this last week with Emily. Um, so folks listening, watching, they can go back and, 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 and view that show. Um, and actually in that, that show, we left a link down below to the NOAA radar recording of the derecho that moved across Illinois. It's just like this, this bowed wave that moves across an entire state. Illinois is a long state and it moves across almost the entire north to south stretch from, you know, I-80 to I-70, essentially. And it took out a lot of trees. And, and, and even if maybe you haven't planted trees because of that, maybe you've planted trees the year before. Um, it's been a rough year for, for young trees. 
because we went into last winter in a drought, it was dry last fall. Uh, so if you planted a tree, yeah, it went into winter with dry soil. Came into the spring, dry soil. And really the only measurable rainfall as we already talked about was has been in this July um, and is drying off again. And, and so I guess, Ken, maybe a, a question that I get a lot of is, so if that's the case, when should we be planting our trees? Is there a recommended time of the year that that works best for our trees? Let's so say in a, a normal year or years when you're not going to have skaters coming out the next year, maybe, you know, fall, spring is typically when we're going to do it. You can plant it in summer, but you're going to have to do a lot more watering, uh, more than likely. But typically going to be that, that fall, spring, when we're getting our, usually getting somewhat consistent rainfall. Um, and that soil is a little more moist. It's going to be the ideal time. Yeah. Yeah. That usually we are, we're recommending a spring, fall planting and summer is when we expect to, to see the drought. I mean, that's happening right now, but this 2023 has, has been the exception to that rule. And, um, and, and so that's just something to, to be mindful of, um, recommendations. They, the, the, not, not always, they're not always going to work. And so I, I kind of, feel like with all of the trees that we have just lost just a few weeks ago in the storm, I think there's probably going to be a lot of people wanting to replant. Um, and it, and so if that happens, I mean, you could plant this fall with the big star that we're going to, the caveat that we're going to talk about here in a second of cicadas in 2024 uh, and causing tree damage. So we'll, we'll get to that though um, here in just a second. So spring and fall for Illinois. Now, Ken, I think um, you probably only have like a handful of these in your office, right? <laughs> Under the canopy. Um, handful so of cases. <laughs> handful of cases, hundreds of thousands of these. So if you're listening, I'm holding up uh, our, our little paper hard copy document. It's called Under the Canopy, Creating Personal Green Space. Um, this is something that Extension partnered with uh, the uh, Illinois Forestry uh, uh, let's see, it's Illinois Forestry Association, U.S. Forest Service, um, and City of Urbana, Illinois Arborist Association. So this is something that we partnered with them on to develop a list of trees that are, are tolerant of the urban landscape. And usually we have to explain this usually what it means to be an urban tree. It's essentially a tree that lives not in the woods. Um, if you live in a yard, whether it is in the city, in the suburbs, or in the country. If it is a yard, that's an urban tree, essentially. It's not living in the woods um, on its own. So there's, there's a listing of trees that have been curated um, by these various groups. And um, so in this document, there is an entire listing of trees, um, and they're sorted by size. And these trees are considered adapted to urban conditions, which means typically lousy compacted soils, uh, usually means uh, it doesn't drop too much debris or, or waste, and, and something that can tolerate oftentimes the pollution that humans create. Um, and, and so these are trees that are, are very well adapted. And someone might notice there's no red maples on here. Thank goodness. Um, I like red maples, but I would not put one in my own yard. And and then, you know, you think of your urban landscape, you're going to have competition with turf, which they normally would not have you know, in a forest setting either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That And that is a, a big one, too, when we think about tree roots and turf grass roots, um, that competition happening just... A, few inches below the soil surface. And again, that's why these trees are selected, that they are a bit more adapted to, you know, fighting it out with the lawns that they're typically surrounded with. So usually when, when people ask me like, hey, what tree should I plant? I often send them this under the canopy. Unfortunately, by some decision here, I, it wasn't my decision that they decided not to put this online to make it paper only. Uh, so I'll mail it to you and you just email me your address and I will send it via regular mail uh, to your front door. Uh, as, as Ken said, we all have boxes of these things and we want to get rid of them. And if Chris runs out, I'll mail them to you. There you go. 
I might send you more than one. <laughs> They're very good resources, though. Uh, it, 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 even when it comes to selecting your tree, they even have diagrams about where to plant your tree. And they look at in terms of distance to the house, distance to utilities, um, making sure that you're, you're selecting an appropriately sized tree for the setting that you have. If it's a side yard, maybe you don't want to have a giant tree that's going to be towering over your house and your neighbor's house or squeezed into a little area. Maybe that's going into the front where there's a bit more room or the back where there's a bit more room. Kind of depends on your yard, um, but they do have diagrams about where to plant these trees. And we definitely want to make sure that we are selecting them for their mature size. Uh, it's awful when you see like an oak tree planted right underneath the power lines, and then it's got to get buzz cut every year by the power company to keep it off of those power lines. They turn into ugly, nasty trees that, that usually fail uh, earlier than they should. Yeah, and then it's got information on how you actually plant it. So digging that proper hole, um, you know, getting rid of that bald, that burlap and all that fun stuff. And I think one part I usually overlook on this is how to select a tree. So if you're going and picking out a tree, what you need, what you should be looking for and what to avoid. So making sure you've got that, that leader, you know, I have multi-stemmed tree, unless that's what it's supposed to be like, and no girdling roots and no damage and all that stuff too. So that's, that's another thing if you're going especially this time of year in the summer and the fall, you know, of our, our box stores are having sales on trees because uh, they've been sitting there all year and they've been limped along. Some stores do better than others on that. And so making sure if you're getting them now this time of year and they're on sale, make sure you take a close look and you're getting a, a tree that's going to survive and do well uh, in your landscape and you're not having to repeat this process in five, 10 years. Ben, why did you have to bring up a pet peeve of mine? I can't help but talk <laughs> about it now. So hear me now and believe me later. Um, that's my Arnold impersonation. Um, that there is something that um, certain garden centers will do to make a tree appear fuller, to make it branch out more. And I call this a different type of tree topping. So Ken mentioned, um, you know, we we there is a good quality and poor quality trees in the garden center. And one thing that the nurseries do uh, is they want to make a tree, like a baby tree, look more like a, a grown up tree. So what they do is they take that central leader, that main trunk, which we want to preserve, but they actually cut off the top, which then promotes branch side branching. And I see this happen all of the time. And, and I will even pop a picture in right here, being right there of where they they tip that central leader, they promote that side branching. But what that creates in 20, 30 years are weak uh, branch attachments or competing lead central leaders. Uh, so when I go look for a tree, I am looking for a strong central leader with no scars or no marks that someone has, has pruned it. I, I, I think if it looks more like a like a skinny whip that's more desirable than if it looks like a full bushy tree uh, because that's not, you typically wouldn't find a full bushy tree out in, in nature. So you want a strong central leader uh, for the majority of our shade trees. And, and there are some trees that are multi-trunked or multi-stemmed. Um, and, and those are typically the smaller trees, um, river birches, service berries, things like that, but they can be grown as central uh, one singular trunk. Um, so look out, for my pet peeve, tree topping or, or, or topping that central leader to give that artificial branching appearance. It'll save you 20, 30 years down the road. And when you're looking at that spacing on the limbs, you want those to be fairly regular, evenly spaced. And like you mentioned, if they're, they're topping that, you're going to get a big cluster, which could be another indication that something has been done or they've been damaged in some way. Mm -hmm. And another thing to look at too as you prepare your your planting hole and you move your tree out to the site most trees are going to be plastic they're going to be in plastic pots not plastic trees what am i saying ah god crazy um most trees are going to be grown in plastic pots so as you're moving that tree to the planting hole that you have prepared then you'll take that that tree out of that pot 
And then if there's any circling roots on that tree, um, make sure that you are pruning or removing those circling roots as best as you can. Because once a root circles, it's always going to be circling. Um, I actually have a pruning saw that I take and I just, I shave off and take that cylinder and turn it more into a cube. Um, it's pretty drastic, stresses the tree and it will set it back. Um, th there's other ways you can do this though, but it, it is best to remove those circling roots um, at planting. You're a fan of root washing? Um, if, yeah, I would, I would root wash if I didn't have anything else to do that day. Um, root washing is a technique where you, you take your, your potted tree, you put it in a wheelbarrow and you just blast the heck out of it with water and you wash off all the soil. And then you identify all of the circling roots and you prune them off. Um, again, that is a very stressful operation for the tree, but it removes those circling roots. You now have, well, I, I will say this, Ken, and, and maybe this is not, not accurate, but you now have a very top heavy tree. You have a tree that probably is going to be probably going to require staking. Um, and it, 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 it really varies. I would not probably root wash a bald and burlap tree. Um, but I, I might root wash a, a plastic container tree. I don't know. What about yourself? Do you, do you buy into this root washing? Um, I don't think I really planted any trees in my landscape. Um, and usually it's <laughs> with shrubs and stuff, it's, oh man, I got to get this plant in now. And I don't really have the time. I, I try to break off. I kind of beat it with my hand, get as much of that body media off. Um, but I don't do a, a thorough job of cleaning it off before I plant. Yeah. The way I can spread the roots out a little bit better when I plant. And, and I'll say it's it's not a bad practice that to my knowledge, it's not a bad practice. It's probably a very good practice. You establishing that root system. So the roots splay out horizontally as opposed to wrapping themselves around each other and eventually girdling or, or choking off that trunk. Um, but I, I just know, especially from a professional or commercial standpoint, when they're planting like 20 to 50 trees, you know, in, in a day, the pros are not going to do this. Um, you know, I, and when I worked on a landscape crew, um, it was dig a hole, um, try to eliminate as many circling roots as you could see, and you got to move on to the next one. Because if you spend all day doing one tree, you're not going to make much money uh, on your landscaping job. So um, that's more of a homeowner, I would say, operation, unless you have a highly skilled, dedicated horticulturist that is root washing your trees before putting them in the ground. So not a bad practice, takes a lot of time. So once the trees are in the ground, now we have to take care of them. And especially if you do something drastic like box cutting that, that root ball or root washing, it's gonna take a lot more TLC for that tree to overcome that transplant stress. Now, Ken, do you know what the number one um, killer of all newly planted trees is people yes <laughs> how did you know it's us <laughs> we kill our trees more often than not and it's it's usually um lawnmower disease and poor watering um and it, it can take when it comes to water it can take those tree roots as we will oftentimes we'll we'll plant our tree and we'll water for a month and say it's good to go that's not the case. It can take up to three years for those roots to move out into your native soil and establish that tree. And so if you planted your tree last fall and you think you're out of the woods for watering right now, uh -uh. it is hot, it is dry. You should be out watering right now. Um, and if you, you know, if you plant a tree this coming fall of 2023, you have to now watch it the 2024 and 2025 for periods of drought and irrigate during those times um, because trees don't respond or wilt quite as quickly as like a hydrangea would uh, or you know a, a bedding plants uh, you know you pick 
you know, tomatoes. And so they don't wilt like that as immediately. Usually when I find that a tree hasn't, hasn't been watered enough, it's too late. Um, the, the leaves, they get scorched, they fall, and oftentimes a tree doesn't make it. And so keep an eye on that water. We, if it's a, been planted within the last two to three years and we get a drought or you know a week or two of hot weather without rain, water your tree. Yeah, and the bigger the tree, the longer it's going to take for that to establish. If you're getting a giant fill in my landscape immediately type tree, mm -hmm. you're going to like looking at a long time for that to get well established compared to a little twig you put in the ground. Yes. Ooh, and that's a great point, Ken. There's a lot of people, they will pay more money for that larger caliper tree where, and that will take longer to establish. And, and, and they have done studies where they've taken the big tree planted it and they took the smaller caliper tree and they planted that same time same place and they noticed that that smaller tree establishes more quickly and over the course of like year you know a couple years that smaller tree can wind up catching up to that larger tree because it, as you mentioned it takes longer for that bigger tree to get established so sometimes the smaller tree wins the race it's a vote for us small guys hey small guys so one more post-planting care thing that I, I will talk about here before we dive into our, our cicadas is going to be um, mulch. And mulch is something that I utilize around, the, around my tree to insulate the soil, which helps keep the soil moisture up. So drought or those wide swings of dry to wet weather, they don't affect the tree as severely as if a tree wasn't mulched. If it was either bare, earth, or turf grass, um, I don't put mulch up against the tree trunk. I leave about a two-inch gap between the mulch and the tree, so no mounding against the tree trunk. Uh, it's the the leads opportunities for possible rot, rodent damage, um, and, and the like. So, you know, avoid the muffin and plant. Or, or mulch like a donut or a bagel, uh, a little healthier than a donut. So uh, think bagel, not muffin. And that mulch is going to help avoid that lawnmower, string trimmer, weed whacker, whatever you want to call it, disease. Um, and that's, in a lot of times when you go out and look at trees, I don't know about you, but a lot of times the damage is, you can see where the, that tree has been hit mm -hmm. and you've got that, that girdled section now where you've got no bark growing anymore. And that will eventually lead to the decline of the tree. As you yep. keep opening up, you've got that big wound now that probably isn't going to heal. Mm -hmm. And rot will move in. And over a period of years, it'll slowly decline. So mm -hmm. one of the big things, and even if they don't have any lawnmower string trimmer damage to trees, if I go out and look at a tree, tell them to mulch if nothing else, so you do not, you avoid hitting it with that stuff because that's a pretty quick way to, to do some pretty good damage on your tree. Yeah. It, you know, I was recently on our local public radio about the, the derecho and like tree wounds and things. And, and my little spiel about tree wounds that didn't make the cut, uh, probably because it's boring um, and, and not at all interesting to people. But tree wounds are pretty fascinating stuff. Our, our colleague, I think it's Ryan Pankow, he has a webinar. Uh, we can put a link to that down below. It's about compartmentalization and how trees how like these wounds that we're seeing from the storm, they never go away. The tree kind of seals that off and grows around it, but that that wound stays with that tree for the rest of its life. Um, and it's just, just fast. I think it's cool. So go check out Ryan's webinar all about that. Maybe we can have Ryan come on and talk about tree wounds and we can enthrall our listeners with how trees do that. Um, <laughs> so Ken, we're talking about newly planted trees. Without a doubt, trees are going into the landscape. Maybe now after this storm here this past in Illinois, we're going to have even more trees going into the landscape to replace the ones that we've lost. Why might this be a problem in 2024? Because of the cicadas. Uh, so when, when you get these periodical cicadas, so they come out either every 17 or every 13 years, depending on, on the brood. Um, so next year, we're going to have both 17 and 13 coming out. Um, which is one reason why it hasn't happened since 1803, because they're not in sync with each other. Um, but when they come out, 
the females are going to lay their eggs and get this ovipositor, kind of like a saw, and they'll put that, lay their eggs into the branches of trees. And those eggs will hatch, nymphs will fall down to the ground, burrow into the ground, they'll feed on the tree roots. But that egg laying in those branches, for big mature tree, you'll get some flagging, so you'll have some dead branches here and there. But the tree can recover, it'll send out a new flush. With newly planted trees or smaller trees, if you get enough cicadas on there, you could potentially kill that tree because um, they've laid so many eggs, you've killed so many of those branches because they basically split it open, split that branch open and lay their eggs. Um, you can lose trees because of that. So typically it's recommended if you've got cicadas coming out the following year, you'd want to try to avoid planting trees the year before. Um, and if you are going to be planting trees, you're probably going to want to net them. Uh, holes no bigger than a quarter inch and make sure that's tied off at the base so they can't crawl up. Um, and those skids are going to be typically emerging May, June time frame. I think it's when the soil at eight inches reaches 64 degrees is when they will start coming up uh, and start that emerging process. So if you are thinking about planting a tree, that's something to keep in mind because the cicadas, if I remember, I think on the maps, it's pretty much the entire state is going to be covered. Some areas will have it more than others. If you live in a new development, there's no old trees. You're probably not going to have any because uh, these cicadas have been in the ground for 17 or 13 years. You come through you know, new housing development, you clear cut everything, remove all the trees. They don't have any food. They're not going to be around. Uh, but if you live in an, an area of town that's got an older, has a lot of mature trees, they've been around for 17, 20 plus years where cicadas may have laid eggs in that area, then there's a greater chance you're going to have cicadas emerging. Work. And you know, if you lived in a subdivision that came, that was built on a farm field, farmland, probably not going to have any cicadas or very few. So you're a little less of a risk there. Yeah. And the, the damage that they create, that little slit they cut in the, in the branches, they'll lay their eggs in there. That branch falls off there. The flagging as as Ken described that it creates um, is it, it, it is something to behold. I, there was one time up in um, Knox County, a brood emerged. Oh, you know, five, I think it might've been six or seven years ago now. And it, one, it was so loud. You could hear them driving on the highway with the windows up. And I think I even had music on or something. I'm like, what is that noise? It was the cicadas. Uh, I can only imagine next year it's going to be way more because that was one brood. <laughs> that was one brood. This is going to be two broods at the same time. But then after that, you could just see in the woods the the flagging or these dead branch tips that that occurred all over. And then in the fall, you know, there'd be a wind windy day or something, and all these branch tips would just fall down all over the place. And so there's going to be a little bit of cleanup involved too later on in uh, in the year. So something to be mindful of. I I don't know if it's something to I don't want to discourage people from planting trees right now, but take those actions that Ken mentioned of of, of netting or that tree so that the cicadas can't can't get into that newly planted tree because it can be very serious for a young tree that has not yet established itself. Yeah, and that so the, the two broods, the nineteen brood nineteen, that's a thirteen year cicada. That's going to be more of the southern half of the state, and then brood thirteen, which is the seventeen year, yeah. is going to be more the northern half of the state. So there may be a little overlap in like central north central yeah part of the state our part um, of the state <laughs> but a lot of that's going to be um fairly separated so in some places you may have both coming out um for most of the state, you're gonna have one or the other and there's gonna be multiple species within that um so yeah illinois is kind of cool because we've got what five or six different roots that come out we have both 13 and 17 year i think all seven of the recognized periodical scale species come out in illinois so we're like one of the hot spots for periodical cicadas. So is it true that the cicadas, they're all prime numbers? Is that right? They're yeah, uh, periodically it's all 13 or 17. One of the thoughts for that is for predators, for whatever reason, predators, animals have a hard time developing on those prime numbers. Uh, so by coming out every 13, 17 years, you avoid you know a lot of predators. And when you come out in mass, when you have millions of them coming out at once. The predators that are there, they're not going to be specialized on cicadas, but any kind of animal is going to eat them pretty much. Mm -hmm. 
but they, there's millions of them coming out. So they basically just overwhelm the system. The first, the first ones that come out, they're, you know, eaten pretty quickly, but as more and more come out, animals can only eat so much and they kind of gorge themselves and then everybody else gets to come out and, and mate and lay eggs and, and you just overwhelm the system. So that's why there's so many. And, and that prime number one theory is that, yeah, that, that it makes it difficult for those potential predators that would potentially specialize them on them or for them to develop. Interesting. Well, so there is one specialized predator that, that does uh, kill cicadas, but that's kind of an annual, you know, your dog day cicada um, predator. That's the cicada killer, um, the wasp, hornet. Wasp. Wasp. Yeah. So your periodical cicada. So when people think of cicadas, if you haven't experienced the periodical cicadas or it's been a while, periodical cicadas are kind of a black, they have orange wings and red eyes. You can pop a picture up now. No, that's because I had one. 2021, we had one emerge in our yard. So I don't know if that was a straggler or an outlier of one of the other broods. I tried to catch it, but it flew away and a bird ate it immediately. It was kind of cool. Um, <laughs> it made up for my disappointment of not catching it, but I didn't get a picture <laughs> beforehand. Um, but our dog day or annual cicadas, those are the black, green, and brown ones that we see. And they're coming out this time of year, July, August, making all the noise uh, in the treetops and stuff, which the periodical cicadas will do. We'll do too, but they're coming out in May. June timeframe. So they don't really overlap those two populations. And the cicada killers are coming out with the annual cicadas. And they're going to go up into treetops, capture them, paralyze them, drag them down into the ground and lay their eggs on them. So they don't, they're only going after the the dog day annual. They're not going to be a factor at all with the, the periodical because they're coming out later than the periodical do. And so don't kill your cicada killer Wasps. I mean, they they get big. They're menacing looking. Uh, I I see I I see them all the time, um, especially in like uh, that southern exposure, kind of bare soil, maybe more of a sandier uh, type soil. Um, that female, she just wants to kill a cicada and take it back to her den. Uh, the males that kind of hover around the surface, they maybe they'll be a little bit aggressive towards you, but guess what? Can't sting you. Uh, they were not given a stinger, and so they can buzz around you all they want. They are harmless. The female's off working, so don't worry about the males uh, buzzing around you. Yeah, the males are territorial. That's why they're getting in your face, kind of like carpenter bees and, mm -hmm. and other things. And those females, yeah, unless you, you step on them or grab them, they're going to leave you alone. They don't care about you. They have no interest in you as long as you leave them alone. Because you're not a cicada. Exactly. She can't shove you down her hole. <laughs> if you start screaming a lot, they'll come after you. But... <laughs> <laughs> Ken, speaking of eating cicadas, do you plan? <laughs> there's another animal that also eats cicadas. How about humans? Can we eat uh, our share of cicadas? So, so humans can. There's a couple of caveats to that. From what I've read, if you're allergic to shellfish, cicadas probably are not something you should be eating because they are all related. They're all arthropods. So. Shellfish, al shellfish allergy, probably want to steer clear. And I came across something that uh, was a University of Cincinnati. In one of the years, cicadas came out in that area, found that they're uh, bioaccumulators of mercury. So that may be something to keep in mind. That's a concern if you're pregnant, small children. Either you want to avoid eating them or not go too crazy with eating them. Uh, but yes, you can eat cicadas. I'd, again, you got to kind of keep in mind, you know, if, you're catching these in an urban area. How many pesticides and all that have been dumped on these trees over time? They've been taking that up. So there, there is some things you may want to keep in mind, but you know, partaking in a couple hopefully shouldn't do too much damage to you. But mm -hmm. yes, and there's even yeah cookbooks on cooking with cicadas and the cicada cookbook. Ken, I can't imagine what your kitchen is like. You know, <laughs> next year is going to be awesome. <laughs> Cicada cookies and cicada chocolates and cicada spaghetti. What are some recipes we got in here? We got barbecue cicadas. You need 60 blanched cicadas for that. Uh, cicada scrambled eggs. Land shrimp. I'm just kind of like cooking them like you would shrimp. And butter. Yeah, butter and garlic. That's how you cook shrimp. Cicada po' boy. <laughs> oh, so, all right, Ken, what stage of the cicada are we grabbing here because it crawls out of the soil and it crawls up the tree and then it emerges from that nymph as then the adult with wings and everything 
Are we eating usually, the adult? Usually, you're collecting the adult, and I and okay. I've never, I've never been anywhere at least when, except when I was a little kid, and I have no memory of it. But I've always seemed to miss the skaters coming out. But from my understanding, is usually you take off the wings. A lot of times, the legs because they're kind of hard, and you don't want those getting stuck in your throat or anything. But mm -hmm. yeah, you're you're picking the adults and and eating them. We have to have a collaboration with some of our nutrition wellness people. Make some videos, so. cicada cooking videos. I've heard they taste like almonds, so they sound like they'd be good in baked goods. I've heard almonds. I've heard shrimpy. Mm, shrimpy almonds. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to find out next that year. Might be gross. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're so, going to find out next year. Only, only one way to find out. <laughs> yes, if we still have a job here at Extension, we are going to eat cicadas for yeah. everyone to watch. It's going to be Maybe. great. We don't have a job. We may have to eat them. We still will have be eating them just to survive. Yeah. Oh. I mean, let me go out and collect a whole bunch, freeze them, if I like the way they taste. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's probably a good idea to cook them. Yeah, especially if you're like a texture person. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Probably be a little kind of like a, a gusher if you remember those skinnies. Mm -hmm. Bite into them and the the liquid <laughs> comes out. <laughs> Nature's gushers. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So next time we're ever uh, together, Ken, and you offer me something to eat, I should ask you like, are oh, there cicadas in this? <laughs> well, yeah, come May, May, June next year. That may okay. be a good question. Or maybe I don't want to know. So, yeah. As long as you're not allergic to shellfish. Nope. So that means I'm, I'll put my cicada bib on. Um, I will be ready come next year. Um, to both eat them and protect my newly planted trees from them. Um, so, and, and, and real quick, going back to newly planted trees, I forgot to mention uh, pesticides. Uh, so mm -hmm. a lot of times people will ask me, okay, I apply pesticides to my trees to protect them. I'm not really going to do much good. Um, they're not, the adults aren't really feeding on them. They're laying eggs. I think there's been some studies done that have, have had sprayed trees and non-sprayed trees, and there really was no, no difference between the two as far as egg laying and damage goes. So, yeah. And you've got those, you know, potential um, off target, you know, affecting other critters out and about. So it's pesticides are not recommended, really not a, a good option. Netting your trees is going to be the best bet. Um, if you have, if you're in an area where you, you will be having them at, in large numbers, if you've only got a handful, you should be okay. Yeah. Cause, cause the damage that cicada is doing, they're not munching on the tree. They are literally using their ovipositor, which is like a saw, and they're cutting a, a slit in that, that stem, smaller than like my pinky. And when you get enough of those slits being cut in a stem, just it, it kills whatever's beyond that in, in injury on that branch. And so, yeah, you, you spray all the pesticides you want, you're not, not going to stop that from happening. Yeah, and the nymphs will feed on the roots of trees, but you know, these things have evolved with yeah. each other for thousands, maybe millions of years. I don't know how long. And trees survive it. You know, obviously they're taking some energy from them, but probably like mosquitoes feeding on you. That's not going to... Just notice. drinking your blood, ignore the disease part. But just yeah, drinking your blood is not going to... That <laughs> That's another show. <laughs> yeah, you've got, you know, a handful of mosquitoes each every night. You're not going to suffer any serious consequences from that. Mm -hmm. Well, that was a lot of great information about newly planted trees, how to pick them, take care of them, and get them ready for the event that hasn't been seen for, oh my goodness, two, over 200 years. Uh, so that that is this is something that we'll be uh, beholding next year. Hey, we also have an eclipse coming through Southern Illinois next year. Oh my gosh, uh, things are lining up here. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I don't know. It's a sign. So but anyway, it's a sign that we should probably wrap things up. Well, the Good Growing Podcast is a production of University of Illinois Extension, edited this week by Ken Johnson. A special thank you for Ken. Thank you, Ken, for hanging out today, talking about trees and cicadas and, and uh, putting our plan together for how we're going to eat our way through Illinois cicadas <laughs> next year. Yes. Thank you. Get your, get your appetite ready. Start looking for recipes. It's going to be honest. Oh, baby, I can't wait. <laughs> and uh, let's do this again next week. 
Oh, we shall do this again next week. It is like 130 degrees outside, but guess what? Time to start planting the fall garden. So we are going to be chatting about what plants you could be getting in the ground right now uh, in Illinois for fall, provided that it drops below maybe 95 here in the coming weeks. So we'll find out. Uh, well, listeners, thank you for doing what you do best, and that is listening. Or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching, and as always, keep on growing. Stay cool.